Well, I think I'll go ahead and kick things off. I wanted to thank everybody so much for your willingness to do this. Um, I know it's going to be a little bit uh, more impersonal than maybe if we could, you know, do this in a big room and just go around and ask questions from, you know, uh, the ITEA membership. But we thought uh, with, with so many different schedules, it'd probably be a little bit better to just kind of find a time we can do this via Zoom and record it. And um, we'll, we'll try not to go uh, much longer than, you know, 45 minutes to an hour just to be courteous to all of your schedules for today. And we'll air the full unedited uh, interview on ITA's website if they let us or if not uh, one of our websites or YouTube or something. Um, Snapchat, I don't know how that works, but something, it'll get out there. And then we'll do a, a little bit more condensed version of this with a couple other interviews on a couple different other careers uh, and, and kind of splice them together for an hour long presentation for VTech. So thanks again. Um, so I'll just uh, quickly introduce everybody and then uh, I'll just kind of go around my screen here. And if you don't mind, just kind of telling us a little bit about um, where you're at now, uh, how you got to your current position, your influences, um, any of the opportunities that you had that you really felt made a lasting impact on uh, winning your, your first job or your current job. Anything along the way that might help uh, the ITEA membership learn a little bit more about careers in higher education, how to apply, how to, how to get to this point. You've all achieved so much in your fields, and it'd be great, uh, I think, for everybody to hear a little bit about that. So uh, from Texas, we have Charles Villarubia. Hi. We okay. have, uh, in my bottom right, uh, Justin Benavides from Florida State. Uh, who's having a much better basketball season than uh, UK did. <laughs> and then uh, just below me, we have uh, Gretchen James, uh, who's coming to us from Arkansas today. And then uh, Demandre Thurmond, who is coming to us from Alabama today. And then my co-host is Mark. Mark is on faculty at the University of Idaho. And my name is Matt Hightower. I'm on faculty at the University of Kentucky. And we're going to be your panelists today. So uh, if we don't mind, uh, Charles, you're, you're first on my right here. Uh, would you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got to uh, Austin? Sure. Um, my, uh, my, my path here is, has been maybe um, a little bit circuitous and somewhat a traditional. Um, I'll start out by saying I do not have a terminal degree. I am not a doctor. Um, I started out right out of my master's degree at Boston University. Um, by the way, I did my undergraduate studies at Louisiana State. But when I completed my master's, I, um, I immediately got a job uh, in, with the Dallas Press. Um, and about five years later, four of us formed another group called Rhythm and Brass, and that has been the bulk of my performing career. And one of the things that, that um, one of the benefits of that is that you you, you travel so much, you meet so many people, uh, you see so many things, it opens your eyes to many, many different um, avenues, uh, many different angles on the music industry. And um, shortly after, um, you know, shortly after I, I started touring, I, I started teaching at several uh, uh, universities in Boston where we were still living. Uh, Boston University. Um, I started teaching at Longy School of Music and eventually at New England Conservatory. Um, University of Texas called my wife and uh, and said we really want you to be our flute professor. So um, we we both moved down there. I'm what in higher education they called a spousal hire at the time, and uh, they hired me to uh, to work with uh, brass chamber music groups, which is in my wheelhouse and that's what I was doing and that's what I, I really, uh, where I cut my teeth. Um, so my, my, my path to, to, uh, to academia comes uh, via playing small groups and um, I think it's that in, in, in academic parlance, um, we call that uh, experience commensurate with a terminal degree. So um, that, uh, that idea of, of having the experience um, to suit, well suit the position without having that doctorate, I think was very important for me. Um, by the way, my, my wife is a distinguished professor here and she has a bachelor's degree. 
Um, so, uh, but, but she also has 10 years of playing with the Boston Symphony. Um, so, you know, that, that kind of experience is, is valuable if you're somebody who, who is in a position to be, to be performing that much. Um, it's, it's, it's just as valuable as having that, uh, that doctorate degree. Absolutely. And I think it's important to note, while I was a student at the University of Texas, and I did a mock interview with both Professor Villarubia and his wife, and I think that's part of the reason I've had any success, because she terrified me uh, to a, a large extent, and so that made some of the other interviews a little bit a little bit, little bit, bit easier for me. And just before the call went on, he also, also just said I was his favorite student, so I just wanted that on the record real quick. So uh, <laughs> next, uh, Professor Benavides, could you tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, let me start by saying how much of an honor it is to be part of this panel with my esteemed colleagues. You know, my path um, was somewhat of a direct one. Uh, I was a student that knew that I wanted to teach at the university level. Uh, as I pursued, you know, my relevant coursework uh, and the degrees for that path, but you know, that's not to say that it wasn't without my path wasn't without its challenges. Uh, I'm originally from Texas. And uh, I, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of North Texas with Don Little. And uh, I pursued my master's and doctoral degrees at the University of Michigan with Fritz Kenzig. Um, in the early part of my career, I taught at university positions in Texas and New York. And of course, now I'm in my current position at Florida State. But at the end of my doctorate, uh, and after having submitted several university applications, I did not have a position offered to me. You know, I didn't even have an interview at the time. And uh, following the, the year after my graduation, I, I did not have any significant work. I, you know, I found that that's something that is becoming increasingly common in our field as we have so many talented doctoral students and so many, uh, so few limited positions. So in my situation, I continue to seek instruction uh, both to inform my playing, but you know, also to give me insight into teaching pedagogies. And uh, one of the most significant experiences that impacted me were my studies with Warren Deck at the Aspen Music Festival. Um, in addition to my formal studies with Don Little and Fritz Kenzig, that particular experience paved the way for me to find a lot of consistency in my performance and a lot of, um, a lot of malleability in my teaching that prepared me for my first tenure track position interview, which I was fortunate enough to successfully earn. So, you know, I think students often believe, or at least that I did, that the learning for this field happens primarily within the walls of the program and of the walls of the university. And, you know, of course, that's the first source. But in my experience, I found, you know, there's so many workshops and festivals and ways to get in contact with virtually every player or teacher nowadays that it's somewhat naive to limit your learning to one source. Um, you know, so that, that's what I pulled from my experience. Great. Um, Professor James, uh, would you tell us a little bit about your path? And especially since uh, you have a, a very wide uh, diversity of skills and a wide array of things that you do at Hendricks and some other institutions you teach at. Sure. Uh, thanks again for uh, the opportunity to be part of this panel. I'm thrilled to get to join you all. And you're right, Matt, my current job requires a lot of varied things. So I am the director of bands at Hendricks College, which is a small liberal arts college in central Arkansas. I'm also the visiting lecturer of tuba over at Arkansas Tech University, and I play tuba with Serif Brass. So the way that I got here was through a collection of euphonium and tuba performance degrees, but honestly, the one that was probably the most important was the master's degree in conducting that I discovered I could pursue at the same time that I was doing my doctorate at Michigan State. And I always tell people that it's because of that degree that I have a job right now. I was looking out at the college teaching world as I was coming through my graduate degrees in particular and starting to look at, well, what are those jobs out there? What can I actually get? And in the year that I applied for a college teaching position, I probably sent out something like 40 or 50 applications and maybe five or six of them were for tuba euphonium jobs. And here I was thinking, oh, I, well, I've done everything I possibly can from a tuba and euphonium standpoint. I've done competitions. I've done some arranging. I've done this. I've done that. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. Let me put my foot out there and see what happens. Nothing. <laughs> I didn't get anywhere in those interviews. And so I learned that, well, if I want to get started somewhere, 
probably the best type of position is going to be one of those first jobs, which incorporates a lot of different things. And I was lucky that from guidance I'd had from my teachers, Velvet Brown and Ben Pierce and Phil Cinder, and my conducting teachers, Kevin Setatal and Kevin No at Michigan State, that they had helped me see this ahead of time. And so that's why conducting became part of what I did. And I turned out, it turned out that I really liked it. So it wasn't just to get a job, but it was something I really enjoyed doing. But then that ended up being the pathway to getting started. And I'm so grateful for it because it allowed me to go directly from the doctorate into a full-time tenure track college teaching job. And I know I'm very, very fortunate to have had that happen. But I'm also convinced that I was somebody who was considered for my current job because of the variety of things I could offer. And I was also really fortunate in the last year of my doctorate to have an opportunity to do some adjunct classroom teaching. And that's part of my job here too. And so I think that probably helped the committee folks gain some confidence that, okay, yes, maybe maybe this person could do all the parts of this job, of which there are many. Absolutely. I think in this climate, versatility is the name of the game. I think that's it's really important in this this uh, really, really oversaturated uh, job market. Having all those extra skills are so important. So thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Demandre, Professor Thurman, could you tell us a little bit about your journey? Sure. Um, <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, when I went to college. I knew I wanted to study in music. Uh, but I did. Uh, what I did know is that I didn't want to be a, a, a public school band director. You know, I was that kid that you know caused a lot of trouble, particularly in in junior high school band. You know, after after the music was done, I was that kid that wrestled and you know just mischievous. That was that was me, and I'm not that strong of a disciplinarian, so that that wasn't something that, that I wanted to do. And so you know, I really wanted to play in a service band, but you know, being overweight that that was something that was off, gonna be off the table for me. I was never a small kid, not even at the very first day of my life. <clears throat> so that wasn't gonna be something that I could do. Uh, but all along, I was studying music with people that I valued. So uh, James Jenkins was my first euphonium teacher in, in college. I studied some with Dan Drill in high school. He got me really prepared to, to, st to study at the University of Alabama where I did my undergrad. And I was studying with James Jenkins, who at the time was, he was the only black classical musician that I knew and certainly the only one that, that played tuba uh, that I knew about. And, uh, and that was just sort of exciting. And he was a really uh, interesting musician <clears throat> in that, you know, obviously he was a really terrific classical player being in the Alabama Symphony at the time. And he, displayed a lot of interest in jazz and non-classical music, which that, that suited me very well, just from my own upbringing uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a black kid in the South. And so studying with him was great. And one of the first people he mentioned to me was John Stevens, because we were playing pieces like music for tubas and you know, diversions and things like that <clears throat> in, in tuba euphonium ensemble. And so John Stevens was always a name that stuck out to me as someone who I thought was interesting. And so as I continued my undergrad studies at the University of Alabama, uh, and that whole time I was doing a multitude of things from playing tuba to playing trombone. I was playing a lot of chamber music, quintets and tuba euphonium quartets. I was playing all the styles, orchestra, I was playing first trombone, I played principal, or I played lead trombone in the jazz band, I was doing everything. And James convinced me that John Stevens would support you know, my desire to continue to do a lot of different things. So I did my master's degree at the University of Wisconsin, still not really knowing what I wanted to do. I was just gathering music as much of it as I could. And after I finished my master's degree, didn't have a job lined up. I'd apply for a job at Virginia Commonwealth University and I didn't get it. Uh, Ross Walter got that job, he's still there now. Um, and I was planning to move to Chicago. I was gonna start trying to become a freelancer and I was gonna dip my toe in the orchestral world to see if I could you know, maybe score something as a trombone player. Cause by then I gathered some skills and met some people and done some festivals. And then uh, Mike Dunn, who was my teacher at the University of Alabama when I graduated, uh, gave me a call and said, Alabama State, which is a historically black college, has a job opening for low brass. I think you would be perfect for it. You know, think you're interested in coming back back home because I'm from Alabama. And I was like, well, that's, that sounds good. I'll, 
I'll, I'll throw my name in the hat. And this was like late June <laughs> of, of that same summer. I just finished my master's degree and nothing happened with that job. And so I'd already started packing my things and uh, was getting ready to move to Chicago. And late July, they called and asked if I would interview for that job. And I said, sure. So I went home to Alabama, uh, two hours south of my home in Tuscaloosa, Montgomery, went to Montgomery gave the interview a week later they offered me a job 10 days later i moved from from wisconsin to uh to montgomery and started teaching low brass at alabama state i had 30 something students when i got there it was kind of a remarkable deal and uh, i taught there for seven years uh and while i was there i developed the wind ensemble started the wind ensemble from scratch uh there along with the dean uh, there at the time dr lamar and again, just because I was at a small school, similar to what Gretchen described earlier, um, I was able to just sort of do a bunch of things. I had taken conducting lessons at both other degrees, both stops, Alabama and Wisconsin. So I was able to teach conducting along with, with working um, with the wind ensemble, obviously that I'd started and um, apply for a bunch of jobs while I was there. The only one I even had a sniff at was the Eastman job, which Mark Kellogg got. And, Nothing else did I even get a phone interview or anything for. And Jerry Young was the person who said, Demandre, your stuff is awesome. You should you should start a doctorate. I don't care what it's in, just start a doctorate. And so I chose to start a doctorate in trombone performance, actually. I uh, did that at the University of Alabama. And the year I finished my coursework, uh, I got the job at the University of Alabama when Mike Dunn left to go to the University of Colorado. So here I'd done all this coursework at this school and you know, they offered me the tuba euphonium job through what's a program called a targeted hire. If they could find a minority that had all the skill sets, you know, to to uh, service the job at a high level, then they wouldn't have to go through a national search. And that's how I got that job. And so, you know, between Alabama State and University of Alabama, that combination, I feel like, is really what put me on the path to end up at IU now. Well, thanks. Thank you all for sharing your stories with us. Um, and I want to ask another question, sort of piggybacking on what you've already talked about. Um, I've, there's definitely a theme of the traditional go through your doctorate in tuba or euphonium or whatever, all the way through and then getting a job sort of doesn't seem to be the path that everybody that that, that is working these days. And so um, I also heard you, Demandre, say that how you really didn't know what you wanted to do. You just wanted to do more music and you were taking in a lot more things. Um, and so I would, I would ask all of you, and we'll start with Demandre, we'll go back the other way around. Um, what is some advice you could give to students or professionals who are seeking positions in higher education in this increasingly competitive job market? Advice you wish you had received, but also to those who are thinking, gosh, I don't know if I'm gonna get a job. You know, the students today that I've noticed are very concerned about getting a job and what they're going to do. And so they, they tend to shy away from continuing because they're afraid of getting a job. And so what, what kind of advice would you give them as they're coming up? Yeah, the, the, the modern student is, is interesting. Uh, I, I've, I've really had to adjust to the, what I call the carrot thinking where, you know, there's always something to grab. Um, and I think that's started in high school, you know, where, where everything has a, ter a, a termination point, you know, and I, and I, I was so the opposite where, you know, learning music to me was the thing. I figured the job would take care of itself. And so I have a tough time relating to, to the modern student because, you know, while we're learning things and, and you know, trying to put together, you know, their best self, if you will, you know, it's all geared towards one thing or the other thing. And that's, that's disturbing to me because, you know, being a holistic musician really allows you the most flexibility, which I can't seem to convince my students of all the time. And so, <clears throat> you know, the one thing I've been saying on these Zoom classes for an entire year now is to remain music musically curious, you know, if they're aspects about music that you <clears throat> find fascinating or want to know more about, go that route. You know, it's going to help you be prepared for your potential job, whether that's in a military band or what we're talking about here, the college 
teaching realm, it's going to help you. you. You never know. You may have to teach that rock history class and that stuff that you love, you know, and investigate that music more while you're in school. So I, I, I try to tell people to stay musically curious. I try to tell people that the job market is going to be constantly in flux. And so the only thing you can do is be ready when when the job com comes open. You can't force a job. Stop emailing people at schools where you want to work to see if they're going to open something up. You know, they're just not going to do it, you know. Uh, so just keep yourself ready, you know, find all of the avenues of music that that you find interesting and explore them. You know, uh, Gretchen mentioned it earlier. That's that's basically how she got her job. You know, conducting was something that interests her. She was able to uh, finagle it into a degree and it helped her land her first job. That's the right way to do it as opposed to going, well, what other thing do you think I could do, Demandre, to help me get a college job? I don't know. I really don't know. Let's 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 concentrate on the euphonium first, and then we can sort everything out out later. So being patient is a thing that you have to do in our field. Staying musically curious, and hopefully being in love with music and the craft of teaching, as opposed to just wanting employment, which I think is really difficult. So I'll stop now. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's go to Justin. Could you answer the same question? Sure. Yeah. You know, I feel exactly as as you uh, as you mentioned, Demandre. I, you know, I think learning music as its own reward and cultivating curiosity are absolutely aspects that a lot of students are are nowadays, in my experience, are geared towards the end goal, and uh, and it's easy to lose sight of what we're trying to build as people and as musicians. Um, you know, I find that if you can cultivate that curiosity, it's not only going to prepare you, as you mentioned, but it's it's also going to sustain you. So learning a double instrument, specializing in marching arts, learning arranging, composing, learning conducting, as has been mentioned, all these things are not just to get to the, to the position that you desire, but obviously to sustain you as a musician. Um, you know, I would add, uh, for me personally, it's been um, something that I would advise a lot of students is being willing and open to taking the properly calculated risks. Um, I, I try to tell everyone in this field that um, when you are looking for a position in higher ed, you, you absolutely don't have the benefit of, of choosing where you want to live or uh, choosing the students that you want to work with and being open to any and every situation because um, as we've mentioned several times already, as the field is as crowded as it's probably ever been. I do think there are still opportunities for those that want to put themselves in those positions, but that means being open to moving in any place uh, and taking any job, particularly at the, the first steps of the career, being willing to take those what might be scary steps, but going for it. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Gretchen, could you tell us a little bit about what some advice you would give students? Sure, I echo and agree with everything that's been talked about with regard to versatility and the idea of adaptability, adapting and finding a way to get that first job. I think the one piece that I would add to it is that any teaching that you do is going to help and support your other teaching. So the kind of things that I have to do as a conductor, for example, long range planning and organizing are things that then go directly into my tuba studio teaching as I help a student prepare for a recital. We do the same kind of long range planning of, okay, dress rehearsal this week, by this week, all the pieces need to be up to tempo and you're rehearsing with your pianist and so on and so forth. It all feeds itself. And so that's why I'm in huge support of, yes, you might want to eventually be a studio professor of tuba and euphonium, but hopefully you can find yourself willing to take a job that will have you doing other things because those other things will then help you be a better tuba and euphonium teacher. I think one additional thing that I don't think we've talked about yet is the idea that college teaching, especially if you're hopeful for a tenure track position, which is a really great kind of position to get if you can, College teaching is about so much more than just teaching lessons or classes, right? So there, yes, there is teaching, but there's also the professional development. There is also the community service element of things. And so 
as you're applying for a job, as, as I might be sitting on a committee, I'd want to be looking for someone who I think could actually get tenure. Somebody who I think is actually going to, well, first of all, be a good teacher, but also continue to develop themselves professionally. So continue to perform, continue to have creative interests and maybe even research projects that will help them keep growing musically and um, as a teacher. And finally, is this person going to be willing to serve the broader campus community? That is important no matter where you go. And I see it, I think, especially clearly in a school where at Hendricks, you know, all the faculty work together. Our faculty meetings are everybody in the same room or on the same team's call <laughs> in this particular year. So there's a much broader sense of collegiality that folks are going to be looking for in your materials. And it's, it's something I didn't really think about in those terms. I was lucky that I had teachers who pushed me to try these different things. And I ended up with a CV that I think displayed some confidence that yes, I would continue to do these things. I would do my job and I would do it as best as I could and I would keep trying to get better at it, but then I would also serve the community. I would also develop myself professionally. And those those things are important to, to try to highlight. Thank you so much. That's, that's some things that I did not know before I started doing this either. So <laughs> I think that's good for students to know. Um, Charles, how about you? How long have I been doing this? The mute button. Um, yeah, I think part of being a, uh, an effective teacher is being able to say the thing, same thing about 15 different ways. Um, so here goes. <laughs> Ditto for everything that's been said, of course. Um, but be interested. Be engaged. Be curious. Um, keep all avenues open. One of the most... Um, one of the hardest things for, for me to hear as a, uh, as a university teacher is the, the student who comes in the room and says, I want to be principal tuba player in a major symphony orchestra. And it's not hard from the vantage point of, of, of goals and aspirations. It's hard from the vantage point of that aspiration coming at the expense of everything else. So the idea of being malleable i think is incredibly important you know um i think gretchen and, and demandre have this conducting experience which is amazing i keep telling students that what else do you do conduct have you ever been in athletic bands yes i loved it good get interested in that again understand these things justin mentioned the term the marching arts you know there's a lot of opportunity there so um the thing is, is that my greatest, the, the, the best <clears throat> piece of advice I can give is make sure you start thinking about defining success in the, in the industry on your own terms. Because if you don't define success for you, I can guarantee that somebody else will. And um, I think that that myopic way of thinking comes from um, the symphony orchestra musician being the um, in that exalted position, and 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 trust me, every every student I talk to, I, I always put this caveat in there. I have nothing but respect for those folks who do that job incredibly well. It's demanding. It's an art in and of itself. Those who do it really well, I'm in awe of. But that's not the only thing that that there is to do. And so I think the, 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 the umbrella of how we view success in the music industry has been defined for us for a long time um, by that kind of paradigm. And I, I think people are capable these days of um, what we call quilting together a career where, you know, I have students right now that just graduated with their master's degree from the University of Texas that they're, they're teaching in, in the schools here privately you know, they, they can have as many students as they want. Some of them have 50, 60 students. Some of them really love that. And then you start combining that with, with you know, doing this recital or a little publishing or maybe writing for a journal. Maybe that's something that, that I don't believe has been mentioned. Learn how to write. Be good at writing. Work on your writing skills. So um, this idea of, of keep continuing to explore for the right reasons, you know, will will 
give you the best chance of hitting that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, not trying to go straight to the pot of gold. That's fantastic. I'm telling you, Mark, we've got to do a podcast, man. This each one of these could be like just hour hour long gold. Um, and some some great points. Um, I liked right before Professor Villarubia's advice. There was a big like thunder strike behind him. Um, and uh, Gretchen, your response actually uh, takes us to our, our final question for everybody. Um, it's it's a three parter, but it could be very very short. We're just curious about uh, what are some of the more challenging parts about your job, the more rewarding parts about your job, and then the thing that maybe took you most by surprise. And one thing Gretchen mentioned was the committee work. I know in my uh, my position, it's split into three parts. It's 10% service, it's 40% creativity and research, and it's 50% teaching. And that kind of distribution was something that certainly took me by surprise in how to really engage with the community and and to as as Gretchen mentioned you know be a part of not just the the musical community within the University of Kentucky but the greater Lexington community at large um, so just curious with with each of you those three things the thing that you found the most challenging the most rewarding and maybe the most surprise as you entered uh, full-time faculty employment and we'll just we'll scoop right back around the other way starting with uh, Professor Villarubia sure yeah um <clears throat> I'm not sure that our system here is as, as, as neatly divided up as you, you just explained, but yes, of course, we have, uh, we have service to um, the college, the school, the uh, school of fine arts, the university, the, the community. Um, we have uh, uh, research creative and we have teaching. Um, in terms of, uh, of the, the most rewarding and the most challenging, um, I would say there are two sides of the same coin. You know, the, 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 the service, the committee work, it's just, it's, it's just being there, being engaged, being part of the, of the process. You know, there are people who, who, will, who will complain and, uh, all day, but, oh, I don't want to do committee work. Well, that's your chance to make a change. So I, I jump at committee work. I really do because it's, 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 it's my time to, to have a voice. Do I find it challenging? Well, sometimes you have to read dossiers and you have to, you have to really do a lot of uh, work, and, and that's fine. I don't find that overly challenging. I find the most, let me start with the most rewarding thing for me, is that, that moment when you're teaching where the light bulb starts to go off and you see in the student this engagement, this understanding, the aha moment. Um, the most challenging part is part of that same process where I'm not necessarily engaged in teaching the subject matter. It's a given that I need to know the subject matter. What I'm engaged in is teaching the subject, the person who's sitting in the chair. So to me, what has always been um, the most challenging and, and, and at the same time rewarding process is understanding who that person is, how they function, how they think, how they learn. What do I have to say to this person that's different than I said to the same to, 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 to somebody else an hour earlier that's going to resonate in a different way? So understanding that the, that for me the teaching part of it is not so much as teaching the subject, it's teaching the person and to figure out uh, it's all it's and I'm not a, I don't have any knowledge of psychology other than what I've learned through teaching. Um, and I think it's really, really helped, helped me a lot. And um, it, it starts to bridge that, that divide between the teacher and the mentor kind of thing. So I, I really, really enjoy that process as, and I get, as I get older and, and ostensibly wiser in the business. Uh, that's what I'm invested more and more. Thank you. Um, Justin, same question. Yeah, so I, I really enjoy hearing what you just shared, Charles. I, I, I'm lockstep with you, I feel like. Um, I think, you know, the challenging and the rewarding part of my job is often oftentimes very similarly the same thing. For me, it's, it's teaching students how to hear music at a level that will create lasting and repeatable change that helps them find their own voice. I think when I started in this field, I, I naively thought that it was about making people better tuba players and better euphonium players and you know as as I've evolved or I, I at least as I hope that my teaching has has evolved I've realized that tailoring the pedagogy or tailoring your teaching to the student is 
is challenging because we all have our own individual skill sets and the way that we speak and the way that we uh, distribute information, but finding the different means, the kinesthetic, the visual, the graphic, however that you can create that change in a student and, and seeing that light bulb moment when it has a connection and it's, it's incredibly rewarding. But you know, I'll throw out another really rewarding part to me, which is uh, the, the importance uh, of proper mentoring and a healthy studio culture. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in the positive effect of community. It's something that I was really fortunate enough to experience in the programs which I attended, but I've, I've been really surprised at how vital it is um, to, to cultivating what you could call success of a student or success of a musician. Um, I've, I think it's rewarding to me because I enjoy seeing how cultivating empathy that breeds into compassion, that then breeds into belonging, is a path to creating really successful musicians, but also great people. You know, at the, at the end of the day, I like Victor Wooten's perspective, and he says the world doesn't need another great musician, the world needs good people. And, you know, being kind and extending compassion are qualities that I think create success in any field. So for me, when I see my students having those qualities, that, that really is the rewarding part to me. Great. Uh, Gretchen? Well, I don't feel that I can add much to, to what's been said on those fronts, so I'll go in a different direction to just add something a little different. Now, going back to the type of job that I have where I have to do a lot of things, one of the most challenging things that I face in a teaching perspective is being asked to teach classes that feel very much out of my comfort zone. And a perfect example is coming up in the fall when I have been asked to teach, team teach a class that we call the Engaged Citizen at Hendricks. This class is for first year freshmen. We teach it in the fall semesters and it is supposed to essentially present Hendricks on a platter to them in terms of who we are and what we do and, and the kinds of thinking that we want them to do by the end of their time. And it is daunting to think about teaching this group of students and doing an effective job with this. It's one of those things that I, I think as my teaching partner and I get farther into it, we'll figure it out and it will be fine. But right now it seems very scary to, to be able to present and, and deliver that kind of class effectively. For me, one of the things that is most rewarding, beyond the things that have already been said about teaching and, and finding that, that pathway to helping students what they need in order to improve and grow as people and musicians, one of the things that's exciting for me personally is when I have opportunities for research and creative interests to combine directly with my job. And I've been really fortunate that that's been happening over the last couple of years and will be continuing going forward through my school's program called our Odyssey Professorships. And making a long story short, it's a major grant opportunity that is allowing me to pursue a project that I call Diverse Voices in Music. And the idea behind it is to commission new works from composers who are from underrepresented backgrounds to write pieces for the Hendrix College Wind Ensemble as well as for us just to purchase a bunch of pieces by composers from underrepresented backgrounds in the band world and add those to our library so that this project can live far beyond the three years that, that it's officially happening. But the thing that I'm, I'm really um, excited about with it is in the fall, we are going to have our first piece that is written for us. We're going to have the composer come. Uh, Seraph Brass, which I play with, is going to come because a piece that we're part of a commissioning consortium for, a new brass quintet concerto with band, they're going to be here. I'm going to bring in a guest conductor friend so we can, we can do this in the fall. So it's just this crashing together of all of these things all of these different threads of my my professional life that I then get to share with my students and bring them along in the process. And that is something that I found very exciting to see them get interested then in the same kinds of things that I believe and know are important. To have my uh, students at Arkansas Tech last semester, I asked them to do a project where they found a piece of music for tuba and or euphonium by an underrepresented composer and then we listened to it together as a class and now to see them wanting to go and play those pieces these are the things that are really rewarding for me when they start to take on some of the things that are that are important to me and that way i feel like well i'll do my thing and i'll, I'll affect and hopefully make better as many things that i can through my own career 
but then hopefully they'll go out and continue some of that combined with their own interests, of course. So those are some of the things I'm, I'm feeling very fortunate right now to, to be seeing a lot of that come together. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Uh, and then Demandre, could you talk a little bit about that for us? Sure. Yeah, that's maybe the toughest question um, that I've had to answer today. Um, part of the reason is, you know, sort of by design, I, I take each day as it comes. And I try to, I, I tell my students, if I can just make it to a pillow and look back and think, man, I got most of that, then, then it was a good day. So I really don't think of things in any kind of cumulative way. You know, I really do try to keep a straight, straight line uh, forward, you know, just kind of mentality with everything that I, but um, the most difficult thing for me to do uh, as a studio teacher is to figure out ways to have my students understand that what we do is mostly about codifying your process, like getting your process in order so that you get to your goals as efficiently as possible, uh, as opposed to being, again, like I like to say, carrot oriented, where, you know, your process change, changes depending on the carrot. And I, 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 I firmly believe that once you understand how you learn, how you gather information, what kinds of things you do in order to process that information so that it comes out at the end in the way that you uh, find pleasing, then you've really figured out how to learn. And I've found that it takes about three years for my students to sort that out for themselves, to get over the fact that they're not, you know, Charlie Villarubia or, you know, Justin, you know, Benita, Benavita is already when they come into college, you know, even though they've been admiring these players, you know, from YouTube and so on and so forth, you know, and they've been playing their music, you know, just trying to convince them that no, you're not there yet. In your mind, you sound like them. It's just like me as a conductor, you know, I wished I were Ricardo Muti, you know, but I know I still have work to do before I get to that, to that level. So let's, let's concentrate on you as opposed to the things that you've heard uh, and believe that you're doing. And that takes a long time, particularly for the undergrad, even with the master's student, I find now that it takes a long time to get them to understand the process. So that's the most difficult thing that I that I have to deal with. But but once they understand themselves and the process is in place and they start to learn a whole lot faster, that's the joy. So it's that it's that same uh, two sided coin that that Charles was talking about earlier, you know, that's the moment for me. And, you know, there, there are nights where I lose sleep trying to figure out how to get that one student to understand more about their process because they came with so much baggage, so many private lessons they've had, so many conferences and institutes and all these things that they've been to. And they have all these information from, you know, all of these great, you know, people that they've worked with and then trying to synthesize all of that information you know, uh, so that they can have a path to be successful through their process. You know, that's, that's the, that's the hard part and the most, the most rewarding part when it finally happens for me. Uh, another difficulty that happens at the, at teaching at a university for me, and maybe my colleagues can amen this through head nods or whatever, is we all have a pretty strong sense of self. I won't call it ego because we've all earned the right to have our opinion. Um, but every single person that you've worked with feels the same way. And so sometimes it's difficult to, to come to something that might be better for the school because you have to sort through a lot of, a lot of people's uh, experiences, you know, their, their personal ideas, uh, their personal agendas, if you will, in order to serve the school the best. And while it's very difficult to do, this is the committee work, the emails back and forth and all of those things, it's worthwhile if you care about the greater well-being of the school, which should be the students. So that can be difficult. But again, at the moment that the thing happens, it's the most rewarding thing you can, you can have. Absolutely. Go ahead, Mark. Well, thank, yeah, well, I just wanted to, um... Just thank you all for your answers, for your thoughtfulness. Um, it seems to me that um, we could spend another hour or two talking about stuff. There's so many questions that I have about 
what you all do in your studios, in your studio classes. Um, I've got lots of questions for um, Gretchen because I kind of have the same sort of job here at the University of Idaho. Um, and um, but I just really appreciate all of your thoughtful answers. Um, and it, it seems to me that you all love your jobs. You love what you do. You love serving the students. And that's what we're all here to do. And so um, I think I think that that speaks a lot to who you are and to um, and to what you do. And I think your students are very fortunate to have you. Um, I don't know if you can hear that noise, but that's my dog snoring. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully that won't get on the uh, get on the final uh, the final cut there. Um, I'm going to move this to the I'm, front, actually. This is going to be the first thing that everybody sees. Um, so I guess um, if we could just sort of quickly end in the last couple of minutes, if anyone has anything else they might want to share with us uh, about um, getting a job in higher ed or what, or just anything else you might want to share. If not, that's fine and we can, we can go on. So thanks. The one thing that I'll say really quickly is make sure your degrees, you know, if you're going to chase school, make sure your degrees go in the order based on what you wanna see yourself doing. So a quick, for example, if you see yourself being you know, a music ed professor, don't get a doctorate in tuba, get your doctorate in music ed. If you wanna see yourself teaching you know, euphonium, you know, get your doctorate in euphonium or get your doctorate in tuba. You know, like make sure your, your terminal degree matches the thing that you want to do in school because otherwise it looks like to a committee that you're floundering and you don't know what you want to do. If you start applying for jobs that your first degree suggests when your last degree suggests that you were headed in a different direction. I'd love to pick up on the degree idea of things. I always tell people that one of my biggest regrets is that I don't have a music ed degree because here I find myself in a conducting position where those methods classes would have been really helpful and I'm kind of learning things now as as I go. The other thing that I've seen happen too is is for my husband. This is another thing that I didn't really think a whole lot about until um, he and I were married and starting to, to build our lives together. There's a lot of flexibility involved when it comes to uh, relationships and moving to different parts of the country and I was fortunate to get my job at Hendrix. I was fortunate that he was willing to give up the gigging lifestyle that he had in Michigan to come with me here and then he found himself, you know, he has a doctorate in trumpet, was looking to do college teaching, but then found himself being willing to go back and get a music ed degree, which he didn't have, so that he could then teach in the orchestras here in town, the public school orchestra system. And he loves it. He really loves it. And so I, I've i learned a lot from him, <laughs> watching him go through the music ed degree, and I've been very grateful to pick up some things as he's gone through. I wish I had it myself, but using him as an example uh, in this particular case, this, this music ed degree wasn't something he initially thought he wanted to do, but then turned out to really love it. So I guess the, the message in all of that is I'm a huge supporter of getting a music ed degree as your, your bachelor's degree, really no matter what career path you want to follow, because you will teach in some way, shape or form. And the other part of it that comes out of my husband's experience in particular is be open to the possibility that what you think you want to do might not actually be the, the, the thing that you wind up doing and really enjoying. And in his case, it really came out of a matter of, of our uh, building our lives together and being married and, and those kinds of things. But it ended up taking him to a place that has been really fulfilling for him. So right there, going back to the idea of adaptability and, and malleability like we were talking about before. I'll throw in an idea here, um, and maybe this is beyond the scope of this session, but I think it's important to find the appropriate life-work balance. Um, I know that as I've gotten older and my family's grown, uh, that is a really important consideration for me. There's no one-size-fits-all for anyone, but I really feel like it's difficult to find fulfillment in life if it's merely defined by career. There is, of course, life beyond, beyond the job, be that faith or family or friends, passion projects. Um, but I find that the typical, the typically, the people that typically enjoy their careers many decades in, by and large, are determined to have a life beyond career. Um, I, I'll say one more thing. It's a, it's a little bit different um, 
part of this similar topic, but um, the idea, as the Madre is calling it, the, the, the carrot, you know, that mentality, um, just to, the, the realization that that is not endemic just to the music business, that um, this is what, this is where we are now as a, as a society, and I can say that uh, I have, a, I have a, a, a daughter who will be going to college next fall, and um, yeah, can you believe that? <laughs> Um, the expectation of these high school kids to build a portfolio of sorts with community service, with very similar things to what we're expected to do, is there. Um, the, the get the job thing it is coming from the parents now, not, not necessarily the kids, but that's, that's the way everything has been kind of constructed in, in our society right now. So she's, um, she, she's, she's going to go with a portfolio to college, you know, when she got into her, to her, uh, her, her first choice for, for colleges, um, in part because she, she did X, Y, and Z to get there. Um, but so it, it's a it's it's part of the same thing that we're all involved with in in our uh, in our society and uh, I think uh, at, at least for right now um, pay attention to it because those who, those who don't do it are, are, are liable not to uh, not to to get their first choice. I I I feel like. <laughs> Oh, so many more topics have come up since we've started talking. Justin, you're talking about work-life balance. I think that's something we all need to discuss together. <laughs> you know, we all need to figure this out. We need to um, try to see how that works. And then, you know, the different projects. How do you how do you um, start a new project? So, Gretchen, you're talking about your grant project with the underrepresented composers. You know, how do we go about um, getting those grants? How do we get about doing that creative activity? Um, and then even even Charles at the beginning you talking about how uh, you have a little bit of an, an untraditional path or non-traditional path with um, a non-terminal degree you know how important is the non is the terminal degree now um, and 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 there's so many things to talk about but I think I think to me I really get a sense that um, that what you have just all said is going to go a really long way for the people who are going to be watching this. I think it's going to inspire them. I think it's really going to um, help them to know that this is possible and that there are so many good things about it. Uh, something that I, you know, we've, we've talked also about um, sort of diversifying your career and your, your interests. Um, that's somewhat difficult I've seen uh, with some of my students who want to do everything. They want to learn tuba and euphonium and conducting and, and uh, you know, rock climbing and all this stuff, you know, they want to add all this stuff, but they're not, they, I, I try to tell them that they need to, they need to be really good at the one thing they're doing first, you know, and then they can start to, to diversify a little bit. And I think that's what some people miss. And that's a whole nother topic. You know, if we want to, if you want to be, um, teaching at, at a college and playing in a group like the Serif Brass and, and conducting this and doing that, you have to be good at what you're doing. And I think that's somewhat, sometimes people miss that too. So that's another topic. So I could go on and on, but thank you all so much um, for being with us. Uh, and we're looking forward to, um, I hope we can do this again sometime. So Matt, you can finish us up there. Absolutely nothing to add. Just wanted to again, thank everybody so much for your time. I know it's early for many of you. So thank you so much. Great to see you all. Take care. Take thank care. you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.